Good morning, everyone. My name is um, Patrick Lestanay. I'm a business development director for Interaction. Uh, I look specifically after financial services. Uh, that's my background. And um, I think within the company, they've associated financial services, compliance. Here you go, you take care of GDPR. So I've inherited GDPR and uh, I'm not complaining. It's a fascinating subject. Um, today, I'm going to give you an overview, give you a flavor of, of where GDPR sort of intersects intersect with our business, which is collocation. Um, uh, first of all, I think I will um, give you a, a small introduction by, inter uh, by interaction very, very quickly. Uh, we're going to zoom on uh, then the state of play as far as uh, cloud migration is concerned on, on financial services. And then we'll get on to the, uh, the drivers of GDPR and some specific uh, uh, challenges where potentially collocation can, uh, can give you uh, some ideas. So who are we? Um, Johan mentioned it. We, we provide um, collocation. I think the important thing to note here is, yes, we do data centers. We operate data centers. Uh, the really important thing to, to note, though, is the value for the customer is, is really in the interconnectivity. Is, who you can connect to within the data center and, and how you can reach your business partner outside. That's really the core uh, benefit that our customers get. Obviously, uh, a lot goes on within the, um, to operate the data center, the physical security, the design, uh, efficiency, et cetera, but it's all about interconnectivity. And in the Nordics, we've got two really booming campuses, both in, um, in uh, Stockholm and in Copenhagen which are doing extremely well. A lot of demand for these um, for, for the Nordics at the moment in terms of uh, data center. So um, the state of play as far as financial services is concerned and the deployments, uh, uh, you know, migration to the cloud. I think when I saw these figures, I was a little bit taken back. I was expecting a lot more uh, spend on, on, on actually public cloud and what is called here hosting, which is really virtual private cloud. But we see that you know, there's still a large proportion of spend on on-premise uh, infrastructure. And, and that is a little bit of a, of a paradox when we see what is happening on the markets as far as the cloud providers who are spending heavily in expanding all over Europe. I mean, there's a real trend at the moment uh, of the cloud service providers going, you know, there's the compute that goes to the data. So they used to operate with one or two data centers in Europe, and now it's literally they deploy in every single country. Compute node, you know, network nodes, everything. And they've sussed that the enterprise, basically one of the biggest obstacles for the enterprise to migrate to the cloud is the sheer amount of data that needs to be you know, transferred into the cloud. And, and that's, you know, the, the, the going to proximity on, in the various countries is, is really a trend. Um, and, and we can see the challenge on, on attacking the uh, on-premise market. So if we then um, look a little bit more at the, uh, the combination of the deployments, uh, we see that it's really about hybrid IT. It's not just everything is in the cloud. There's very few who actually spend only on cloud, just, just you know, 1% in, in the next three years. All companies tend to have a deployment, you know, use public cloud for certain things, will still have a legacy uh, on-premise, and then will be using also virtual private cloud and, and, uh, and hosting services with, with third-party providers. And um, the overall trend is still that, you know, the... Um, Basically, the the on-premise goes down. It will go down from 39. Uh, it will go down from 34 to 29 percent, and and you know the spend on cloud will will go up and 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 exceed 50 percent within the next three years. Right. In that background, there is digital transformation. We've talked about it. So. You know, those are figures that the Microsoft provided uh, to us. Uh, the, one, the one that sticks with me is 60% of computer in the public cloud by, by 2025. You know, that contradicts a little bit what we just saw <laughs> beforehand. But, you know, this is very much not just financial services. It's global. You know, it includes the U.S. Um, and, and the, um, you know, the challenge, the challenge really is, is, as was alluded, how do you migrate from all this legacy to an environment which allows you to take uh, advantage of, of what is going on in terms of digital transformation. 
And that's one of the big, big um, concerns, I think, of, of the um, EU as well, is, is how far back the uh, Europe is compared to the US as far as digital transformation. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a big issue. We see that, um, you know, we're looking at five, this is a study from McKinsey, by the, basically, but I, I like this notion of digital trade deficit. You know, we buy US services and the deficit is up to 5.6% of the total EU US service trade. So when we think about GDPR, you know, the motivation for GDPR is just as much about protecting the individuals, it's also about, you know, basically enabling the digital transformation. The, the way the way the EU looks at this is is literally okay, we need to catch up, we need a regulation. This is one of the regulation which is going to enable us. And, and, you know, we're going to do it fast. If you think about GDPR, it was announced, I think, last year. Um, and you, you need to be ready in 2018. That's, that's very, very short time in financial services for these type of, these type of regulation. You've got, you got years. Here, it's, it's two years. And I think the, the, the motivation is it, it needs to unleash then digital transformation in Europe. So uh, what we are hearing interaction with our customers. Well, first of all, it's board level. It's a board um, level subject. We talked about um, risk appetite. Uh, it's all about how you perceive your risk. And that perception has to come from the board, basically. If, if the board is not involved, I, I think your GDPR program has got very little chances of succeeding. And the, there's two approaches. Um, some of the big banks, they really uh, look at this as an opportunity, like Barclays does. Uh, you know, they, they have to do all these, um, uh, I mean, they have to take care of the digital transformation, IoT, big data, migration to the cloud. And the GDPR is almost like a playbook for them. It's, it's almost a blessing because it gives them a method to, to you know, undertake their digital transformation. And obviously, they've got a culture of compliance, so they've, they've gone in there, they really want to be the, the good guys, and, and they, you know, they, they, they're big fans of GDPR. There's no doubt they're going to be ready. Uh, the other tendency we hear is, is okay, GDPR is there, but you know, I've got my product roadmap. I need to implement it, and actually, you know, the security or the compliance will have to go at the speed of my business, um, and 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 you know, that's that's a completely different uh, perspective. Um, um, one of my good friends is is actually um, undertaking this within the BBC, and and you know, he was telling me, well, you know, we're not going to be the mega good guys who are going to be super uh, compliant. We we just need to implement this so that the product roadmap doesn't get impacted. So there's really two different approaches. And obviously what we hear a lot about is um, you know, sovereignty and, and adequacy and, and the whole issue around, well, so adequacy international data transfer. So we, you know, you're free to transfer data outside the EU if the country is deemed adequate. So he's got, you know, the uh, rules around which are equivalent to the EU. The issue uh, really is that the, you know, the, the decision body around adequacy is not the data protection authorities, it's the governments. So, you know, in a situation like you have with, with the UK, there's, there's a lot of nervousness because although they're very pro-GDPR and, and, you know, the, 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 the rules are going to be very high, um, they're effectively dependent on the negotiation, you know, uh, between the UK and and uh, and the uh, and the EU following Brexit. So, uh, whether we're going to have a similar situation between the um, the EU and the UK than we have today between B yeah EU and and the US, there's a lot of uncertainty, and everyone is actually you know um, uh, planning for should I say, for the worst. So we, we get a lot of queries from uh, big SaaS providers uh, about relocation you know, to, uh, to Europe. Uh, I think, in general, companies are looking for other solutions than just to build a new data center. How can I better anonymize the data? How can I be clever with the encryption and the management of the keys? There's a lot of, um, I think there's going to be a lot of inno innovation in, in that field. 
And what we are being asked, although we just take care of the basic layer, we still um, are asked about certain certifications and standards uh, because effectively what uh, the, uh, both the control and the processors are doing, they, they are vetting the whole chain. They're being proactive. They're checking that you, you know, all the chain of suppliers uh, adopt best practice. So for us, as far as the physical security, it's uh, ISO 27001. Um, and, and, and that, you know, I think it's, it's a sign. You know, if, if you have got your own data center, you, know, you need to start thinking that GDPR actually uh, will require you to, to really uh, um, uh, ensure that you've got the best practice as far as the physical security. And the top three challenges, uh, really, in terms of um, if, if you look at the GDPR security and, and, and infrastructure, I think uh, what we're here really is, is first of all, the physical and network perimeter security. So this is how traditionally um, you know, enterprise and especially financial services have been protecting themselves. Um, unfortunately, we, we've seen with, with um, you know, it's not a case of if, but a case of when there's going to be a breach. Uh, and if that is the case, then you do need to uh, encrypt your data, protect your data so it's not usable uh, when it gets, when, it gets um, when the bad guys get their hands on it. And, and in terms of um, encryption, then the whole question of how you manage uh, the encryption keys and how you protect those keys is becoming a hot topic. So all the major cloud providers have started to develop tools, you know, in order to protect uh, those keys, and it, it involves the usage of um, what is called the hardware security modules, the HSMs. Um, and we're going to see. We believe that you know th this is this is a, a device which is going to be critical uh, going forward. The other big theme is obviously auditability and trustability. Um, there's a lot of um, emphasis on you know proving that. Uh, you protect the data uh, correctly. Um, and what we also see, there's demand for auditability at a physical level. So being able to go and check where the survey is based, uh, you know, that it actually exists and in, in which location. So the new sovereignty formula. So sovereignty in terms of taking control of your data and being able to um, uh, completely control that data. First of all, I think the users of the HSM, which protects your encryption keys, mixed with these cloud access security brokers, so the cloud security gateways. So these are really the software layer which allows you to um, implement your security policies outside of your own environment. So the mix of, of, of this software layer with the, the hardware which protects uh, the keys we see this as an emerging solution to really make sure that you control completely your data. And in actual fact, you can implement this in, in, in co-location. We're starting to see potentially this, this use case. Uh, we already see a lot of customers in the payment space who will operate completely in the cloud and will want to have their keys you know, stored outside of the cloud. And in that case, the HSM traditionally they will they will tend to put it in colocation where they've got really good connectivity from the colocation to to the cloud. Um, we're starting to see a lot more of also the benefit from the the CASB being in colocation in terms of connectivity to the various clouds. Uh, and in I think in general the concept of the HSM being used uh, you know as a service also will probably emerge. Um, uh, in the future, and the great thing about colocation, you've got partners. You know, you can do it yourself, or basically, you can leverage all the um, service uh, providers who who are able to help you with with implementing that solution. So it's a different type of sovereignty. We've always thought about sovereignty: build a new data center somewhere, have your data. I think now it's going to emerge and, and and be a lot more subtle and, and, and based on the you know, very specific deployments in some strategic uh, data centers all across Europe. 
And that's it. That's where my um, presentation concludes. Thank you.